So hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be here today um, and present our, our work to such a worldwide uh, attendance. Um, I'm Noah Rappaport. I'm a senior research scientist at the Hood Price Lab for Systems Biomedicine at ISB in Seattle. And I'll be presenting today together with uh, Tom Wilmansky, who is a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, uh, is the real driving force behind all the microbiome analysis in the lab. Uh, we will co-present some of the work ongoing in our, in our lab uh, that is harnessing the de phenotyping of individuals uh, combined with microbiome data uh, to derive insights on health. Uh, so first, uh, I will tell you a little bit about uh, our lab. Uh, our lab takes a systems biology approach uh, to analyze human data across the lifespan. Uh, Listed here are some of the areas uh, we're involved in, including Alzheimer disease, studies on human longevity, pregnancy and preterm birth, and infectious diseases. Uh, what is common to all our, approach, our approaches is that um, these are projects in which we apply, uh, uh, apply computational modeling of uh, molecular systems, and we integrate data sets that are composed of multiple data types. So um, today we will focus on two of these projects that are related to microbiome data to give, together with other types of data in the areas of, um, and those will fall into the areas of scientific wellness, uh, longevity, and aging. So this is the outline uh, for our talk. Uh, first, we'll uh, discuss uh, the challenges uh, of defining uh, microbiome, what is, what, what is in fact a healthy microbiome. Um, uh, then we will describe uh, the, the use of uh, molecular deep phenotyping uh, for understanding the gut mi microbiome. Um, and then we will discuss the, co the concept of uh, plas plasma metabolomics as a functional readout of the human gut uh, microbiome uh, through a project um, that attempted to predict gut microbiome alpha diversity from blood metabolomics. And finally, um, we will present a project that studied uh, gut microbiome in, a in aging and uh, longevity. So um, we know that the gut microbiome has uh, multiple different biological and metabolic functions. We also know that many of these functions uh, modulate host, uh, host health. Over the last decade, so gut microbial um, composition has been linked to a number of human diseases, and that includes ga gastrointestinal diseases, metabolic diseases, autoimmune diseases, uh, and up to neurodegenerative uh, disorders. Um, so there are uh, multiple ways in which gut microbiome can affect human physiology. Um, for example, it, through its effect on uh, absorption of nutrients, uh, its development in a, its involvement in the development of the immune system, uh, and it also has a role in metabolic homeostasis. So although we have an increasing knowledge on how uh, gut microbiome may affect human health, there is no real understanding of what constitutes a healthy gut microbiome. Um, so why, why is it so hard to determine what in fact is a healthy mi gut microbiome? Um, the reason is that the abundance and the presence of specific microbes um, changes across different uh, geographic locations and environments, uh, which basically makes the translation of findings from one group of, of individuals to another uh, quite uh, problematic. So in this slide, uh, you see results from a paper uh, presenting data from the Guangdong province in China. Uh, this is a, a province that uh, uh, has uh, 108 million people living in it. Uh, it's the most developed area in China with a gross domestic product of in, in 2017 of $1.3 trillion, uh, which is comparable to South Korea. Um, so what you see in the slides are data for about uh, 7,000 participants from uh, 14 randomly selected, selected districts uh, in this province, uh, color-coded by GDP per capita. 
uh, the pie charts present phylum level uh, across uh, frequencies across the districts. Uh, at the bottom, um, you see the huge inter-individual variability that exists even in the phylum level. Um, another important result from this paper was that microbiota that uh, um, that um, models that uh, predicted uh, metabolic diseases that were developed in one location did a pretty good job uh, predicting disease within uh, the data of the same uh, location, but the, mod the model doesn't actually translate across districts when you attempt out of sample classification. Uh, as you see in the right uh, hand of, uh, on the right for uh, metabolic syndrome and type two diabetes, um, when they've tried out of sample prediction, the author got a UC of close to 0 0.5, which basically means that uh, there's, the model doesn't have any prediction capacity across the districts. Um, in fact, among the phenotypes, host location showed the strongest association with microbiota uh, variation. Uh, so the conclusion, uh, oh, the conclusion from this paper, uh, which is cited here, was that localized baseline and disease models need to be built in order to predict metabolic risks. So despite uh, the, this uh, extreme heterogeneity of uh, microbiome composition, <coughs> certain structural features of the gut ecosystems have shown results that are more consistent across, across different cohorts. One of these measures is alpha diversity uh, which, uh, as Christian, Christian mentioned, represents within sample diversity. Shannon diversity uh, is one of the most commonly used measure uh, for alpha diversity in the literature. And uh, also, as um, Christian mentioned, it takes into account um, both the taxonomic ri uh, richness of the sample, meaning how many species, how many different species are represented, uh, and the evenness, meaning how similar in frequency are the species that are, that are represented in a sample. So um, Shannon diversity has been suggested as a marker for microbiome health. Uh, lower Shannon diversity uh, relative to healthy uh, was, uh, has been reported in an individual uh, diagnosed with uh, intractable uh, with IBD as well as in people with uh, enteric infections, such as uh, C. diff, um, uh, uh, as mentioned by Christian. Um, so um, increased Shannon diversity uh, has also been reported uh, in hunter-gatherers, and that suggested that either the unprocessed diet, the active lifestyle, or uh, in turn increase in exposure to parasites um, may contribute to a more diverse gut microbiome. Uh, but not only good things are associated with high diversity, uh, as constipation and harder stool are also associated with higher Shannon diversity. Um, this suggests that higher diversity may not be optimal over a certain threshold. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, scientific wellness. Um, Scientific wellness is a rising field, uh, and what what is essentially what it essentially means is that it takes a wellness perspective, which is to try and optimize health uh, when people are still healthy, and to minimize the chance for a disease coming down later uh, in their life, in people's life. Um, the field is based um, very deeply in science um, because, in a way that hasn't been possible before. Uh, because we didn't have uh, the data tools um, at the cost uh, that we have today. Um, so the development of new technologies and the large reduction in costs uh, have made it feasible to generate large multiomic data uh, in the form of what we call a personal dense dynamic uh, data cloud, uh, which we term PD3 clouds. Um, so what is shown in this slide is a study that was done in our group several years ago um, so we, in this paper, we perform analysis on 108 uh, individuals, which we call the Pioneer 100. Uh, and we utilize uh, um, data on their genomes, proteomes, uh, metabolomes, um, and microbiome data. Um, and, this, uh, and we correlated the different uh, blood and other measures. 
and uh, the association and the structure of the association networks uh, resulted in a number of important biological insight, insights uh, through, so through a partnership with, uh, between ISB and a spin-out company called Arivel. We have extend, expanded this, the size of this uh, cohort uh, and added individuals who have consented uh, to allow um, the de identified data to be used for research purposes. And the expanded data, which is uh, at, this, about, at the size of about 5,000 individual, we call the Arival data set. Um, the, the data available for participants in the Arival cohort, so as I mentioned, includes microbiome uh, coupled with uh, human genome, metabolome, proteome, clinical lab, a wide panel of clinical labs, uh, as well as data from wearable de devices, health questionnaires, uh, and coaching uh, interactions. So these data can be leveraged to provide uh, deeper insights uh, into the biological functions across systems, including the gut microbiome and its relationships to the physiology and, and host health. Um, the first analysis that I will, we will mention today examines the associations between a subset uh, of these data sets, uh, which is the blood metabolome, uh, gut microbiome, um, the blood metabolome and gut microbiome alpha diversity. Um, we utilize data from 16S RNA sequencing, as we discussed today, untargeted metabolome, uh, metabolomics data uh, measured by uh, metabolone uh, for over 650 uh, blood metabolites, three O-link panel, uh, cardiovascular, two cardiovascular panels and one inflammation, inflammation focused panel um, uh, and blood levels of over um, 260 proteins uh, measured uh, by Oling as, and it's a wide panel of 77 clinical analytes and uh, self-reported data on gastrointestinal health um, disease diagnosis and dietary questionnaires. Um, so this is our paper. Um, the question is, can we use uh, this deep phenotyping data to understand what is a healthy microbiome? So our work started with the hypothesis that it might be possible to predict uh, gut microbial alpha diversity from analytes that are measured from the blood and specifically blood metabolites. Uh, if successful, uh, this type of approach could be used for early diagnosis of low gut microbiome alpha diversity, which is potentially uh, problematic. As, as I mentioned, it's associated with, a, um, with multiple conditions. Um, um, for example, recurrent C. diff infection, as we actually saw in the exercise today. Um, and that condition actually accounts for a large number of deaths in the US. Um, yeah, so, um, uh, why, why do we, that, why did we choose to focus on the blood metabolome? Um, so, um, there is a diverse, um, set of compounds that enter our gut lumen, uh, through, uh, the diet, for example, and they get absorbed into the blood. Uh, some, uh, these are metabolites. Um, some metabolites come directly from the diet, some undergo some processing by the digestive system, and another group are what we call microbial metabolites, which are synthesized by the gut uh, microbiome. Um, some metabolites are subsequently modified uh, by the host, for example, in the liver, uh, and these are called microbial co-metabolites because they are metabolized together uh, by the microbiome and the host. Uh, based on this, uh, we hypothesize that the metabolites uh, present in our blood could reflect the composition of the gut microbiome. Um, in addition, while, as we saw, gut microbiome um, changes across in different environments and geography or in diet, uh, we have hypothesized that these uh, small molecular weight compounds may, may funnel down into a more uh, universal set of uh, blood metabolites that will, will that uh, end up af affecting our uh, physiology and will likely be more translatable across cohorts. Um, so 
So in this slide, we, uh, we can see results from a PNAS paper from uh, 2009 that kind of sets the stage for our analysis. Uh, in the bottom, um, you can see uh, that almost all microbial metabolites are not detected in a germ-free mice uh, compared to uh, control mice, uh, such as indole 3 uh, propionic acid, serotonin, and indoxyl sulfate, but their substrates um, are detected in the germ-free mice. Um, this suggests that, uh, at least in animals, there is a connection between the microbiome and this uh, small molecular weight uh, compound that we measure from the blood. Um, so in order to investigate the relationship between the host metabolome and gut microbiome diversity, we applied uh, the LASSO uh, machine learning method to uh, baseline uh, plasma metabolomics data from the Aravel cohort. Uh, LASSO is a computationally efficient um, penalized regression method, uh, which is very useful for feature selection. Uh, in data sets like, such as this, where you have uh, a large number of features, and many of them could actually be collinear and not contribute new information. Um, the inclusion criteria for our uh, discovery cohort uh, required <coughs> that the initial blood draw was taken within 21 days of the stool sample because we wanted to prevent um, a long time passing uh, between when the sample was were collected for microbiome analysis uh, and for uh, the blood uh, metabolomics. Um, so um, we also required that uh, the microbiome uh, was measured by DNA Genotech, which is one of the vendors in the Arval cohort. Um, and that their clinical labs were analyzed by LabCorp. Uh, this uh, kind of narrowed down in, uh, our cohort to a size of uh, 399 participants. Um, so to predict gut microbiome alpha diversity from each of the different um, omics and specifically from metabolomics, uh, we, use, we use a scheme of uh, tenfold cross-validation. Um, which basically means that we randomly partitioned uh, the data set into 10 groups of participants. Uh, and we then trained the model each time on 90% of the data using internal tenfold cross-validation, and then used the model to predict the remaining 10% who were not used to train the model. So uh, this was repeated uh, 10 times for each of the partitions. Um, and the end result was 10 different models uh, and 10 different beta coefficients uh, for, each of, for each metabolite, and 10 different out-of-sample predictions of Shannon diversity uh, for each participant. Uh, this schema, schema generally mi minimizes the chance for uh, overfitting. Uh, and we evaluated the accuracy of the model uh, using out-of-sample predictions. Okay, uh, so a little bit about our cohort. Um, the participants in Erville are generally healthier than the general population. Uh, they're uh, still very reflective uh, of the states people came from, which is mainly Washington and California. Um, nevertheless, we still have a significant representation of uh, all classes of uh, obese individuals. Uh, even we also noticed that we uh, chose to stratify uh, People, uh, people's BMI based on the WHO definitions, which is uh, obese one, two, and three. Uh, the importance of um, this refined stress certification will become apparent later. Um, as expected, um, markers of health such as um, CRP uh, and triglycerides are decreasing with increasing BMI. So um, to our surprise, um, we found that not only were we able to predict gut microbiome diversity from 659 metabolites uh, measured for each participant, um, but we could also do it using a small subset of only 40 metabolites that were uh, retained by at least one of the 10 LASSO models uh, that were used to predict um, Shannon diversity in our process. So the upper plot uh, on the right uh, represents the, uh, presents the metabolome predicted Shannon diversity 
uh, which we call M Shannon on the x-axis versus the observed Shannon diversity um, on the y-axis. So looking at this plot, we see that uh, this small subset of 40 plasma metabolites was strongly predictive of Shannon diversity and was able to explain 45% of the variance uh, in Shannon diversity with a Pearson of 0 0.68. Uh, the bottom right plot uh, shows the average out of sample R square um, <coughs> scores uh, from models predicting uh, different measures of alpha diversity, uh, including Shannon, uh, PD Whole Tree, and Chow One uh, diversity, using either um, only the 40 metabolites um, that were retained in the in the in the model predicting Shannon diversity, and this is shown in red, or the whole metabolome that is shown in gray. So we see here that the LASA model fitted using uh, tenfold cross validation with only 40 identified metabolites. Explained, did a pretty good job also explaining the uh, alpha diversity, the other types of alpha diversity, 50% uh, for PD whole tree and 36% for Chow one. We also see that using the whole plasma metabolome did not significantly improve um, the performance, the predictive capacity of the model. Um, and uh, that confirms that the small subset of metabolite that we identified is sufficient to capture the majority of the explainable variation uh, in Shannon diversity uh, by blood metabolome. Um, when we further narrow down the set of metabolites to only those who were retained by all of the 10 LASM, LASM models built in our process, the intersecting set in included 11 metabolites, which we call core metabolites. Um, when we use um, these 11 metabolites to classify participant with low alpha diversity, uh, meaning in the bottom, which we defined by alpha diversity in the bottom quartile for our, quartile for our cohort, um, using a cross validation and implementation of random forest. Um, so the 11 metabolites alone were able to classify participants um, on the basis of, of the three alpha diversity measures that I mentioned uh, with considerably high sensitivity, specificity, and precision. Um, these results um, indicate the potential to use these 11 metabolites um, as biomarkers for gut microbial diversity. So let's look a little bit on the, on the core metabolites. So nearly um, a third of the metabolites, actually on all the, all the 40 metabolites, so a third of the 40 metabolites uh, identified in our analysis were previously, previously shown to uh, be synthesized by gut microbiota. Another nine are, are potentially mi microbial. Uh, these are again are um, microbial metabolites are again those that are either uh, initially synthesized by the host and then further metabolized by the microbiome, for example, bile acids, um, or, or the other way around, first syn synthesized by the microbiome and then modified by the host, for example, heparate. Um, so our results confirmed uh, metabolites that were previously tied to alpha diversity, such as heparate and picresol sulfate and identified new candidates biomarkers for uh, Shannon diversity. I uh, would uh, specifically like to mention the, um, the top one. Um, the, this is uh, the, the highest positive uh, metabolites uh, that had the highest average beta diversity across the 10 model uh, is uh, 5 alpha andros 10, 3 beta 17 alpha dial disulfite. <laughs> And uh, this is a testosterone metabolite. Uh, we found very little information about it in the literature. Um, and it was higher in men versus women, while a Shannon diversity itself is not significantly different between males and females, um, when you, even when you adjust for age and BMI. Uh, there's two secondary uh, bile acids uh, were also, re two secondary bile acids were also retained uh, in, the, in all the 10 LASA models, but they demonstrated uh, opposite associations with channel diversity. Um, so um, several of these um, microbial metabolites that were uh, retained in our LASA models uh, were shown to, um, to exert uh, biological effects on various 
organs such as the kidney, uh, liver, and the heart. Um, and I'll give you a few examples. Uh, Hyperate is a microbial um, metabolite which is formed in the liver from benzoate, and it belongs to a diverse group of phytochemicals, uh, compounds that are called uh, polyphenols. Um, they are found in fruits, vegetables, cereals, coffee, tea, and um, red wine. Uh, the positive association between polyph polyphenolic metabolites and Shannon diversity suggests um, that a, a diverse microbiome may reflect polyphenol-rich diet. Um, Hyperate was also associated with improved metabolic function in the Twins uh, UK cohort. Um, Another example is the microbial metabolite uh, imidazole propionate, uh, which was uh, negatively associated with the Shannon diversity in our models. A uh, recent study demonstrated that imidazole propionate is synthesized uh, in greater abundance in the gut microbiome um, of diabetic, uh, diabetic patients, and that it uh, is able to impair um, insulin signaling in animal models, uh, directly working on the liver and pancreas. Uh, both of those examples support the notion that um, higher um, microbial alpha diversity is associated with better health. Uh, however, our results also, also suggest uh, the opposite. Uh, for example, p cresyl sulfate uh, was positively uh, correlated with channel diversity, but this compound is a potentially toxic uremic uh, com compound. Uh, similarly, TMAO uh, was positively associated with channel diversity, uh, independent of age, sex, and BMI. And TMAO is associated with diet high in red meat and uh, was previously suggested to be associated with uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, so I'll move, uh, I'll give Tom the floor. <laughs> Thanks, Noah. So I'll take it over from here. Um, so once we discovered uh, the array of metabolites that show the strong correspondence to alpha diversity, we want to take it a step further and see the known gastrointestinal disorder disorders and certain lifestyle habits that are associated with lower alpha diversity is the reflection of these metabolites consistent across different disease states. And to this end, we regressed both actual measured Shannon diversity and in separate models, the metabolome prediction of Shannon diversity against different diseases seen on the slide here, adjusting for age, sex, and BMI. As you can see, for example, abdominal pain or type 2 diabetes is associated negative with a decrease in Shannon diversity. But quite interestingly, the metabolome predictions in almost all every case move in the same direction. Similarly with diarrhea, which is also shown in the box plots to the right, with higher frequency of diarrhea, you have a decrease in alpha diversity. And this is quite strongly reflected in the metabolites we see in our metabolomic prediction, showing that different lifestyle factors and diseases can impact your gut microbiome, but, and the reflection of the metabolites kind of consistently shifts in the same direction. We next wanted to ask an important question is whether antibiotics use disrupts the accuracy of our models. Antibiotics are known to disrupt gut microbiome, they're known to decrease alpha diversity, but also they can impact the gut microbiome in various different ways depending on their mechanism of action. So in this case, if we remove antibiotics users from our models, does our prediction actually increase because we eliminate some of the noise? Uh, to our surprise and shown on the, in the figure to the left, whether we just performed the analysis on not confirmed non-antibiotics users or the whole cohort, our prediction accuracy was very, very consistent meaning that antibiotics do perturb the gut microbiome, but our metabolic predictions are quite good at capturing that perturbation. We also looked at the time lag, since remember, if you recall, we specified that individuals had had their blood taken within 21 days of their stool sample. But we wanted to see that whether, if you're closer to your blood draw, are the models better or worse? And what we observed is that the models don't get any better if you get very close to the blood draw and your stool sample, but there is a decrease in performance the further away you are. So past in tertile three of our participants, so past 10 days, we still get a pretty good performance, but there's a significant drop. So there really is this 10 to 14 day window where we get best performance where the metabolites correspond to your gut microbiome the strongest, which is great. And it can also lead to future 
diagnostic recommendations and how these metabolites can be used in the clinical setting. We next wanted to compare how these metabolites perform relative to what's really the golden standard in the clinic in evaluating people's health at a molecular level, which are standard clinical, clinical lab tests. And these include triglycerides, cholesterol measurements, CRP. To this end, we stratified the cohort into quartiles based on alpha diversity. And we want to predict or identify or classify individuals in the lowest quartile of Shan diversity versus the whole cohort. And quite surprisingly, the 11 core metabolites Noah mentioned were outperformed a whole panel of clinical labs uh, to a pretty large extent, showing that A, these metabolites are quite robust predictors of and can be potentially used to identify people at certain risks because of their low alpha diversity. But also, I think more importantly, we demonstrate that things we measure in the lab and all the clinical lab panels you get tested at in the, in the doctor's office don't very strongly reflect the health of your gut microbiome and potentially other tests are needed to do so. We next actually took the Arvel cohort to advantage since, since as Noah mentioned, there are actually two different microbiome vendors used uh, throughout the course of Arvel and its existence as a company. So we took our models and wanted to see how well do they perform if we use a completely different gut microbiome vendor with a different processing pipeline, different library, and the results were quite consistent. As you can see to the graph to the left, whether we just used our 4D metabolite panel or the whole metabolome, we still could predict a big amount of variance in between people in alpha diversity. Consistent with our random forest analysis from the slide previously, clinical labs showed very little signal when we performed the same analysis. And similarly, a plant panel of over 200 different proteins uh, showed very little correspondence to gut alpha diversity, really pinpointing the metabolome as this strong reflection of what's going on in our gut microbiome. And when we fitted the models independently using cross-validation, which is so shown uh, on the plot to the right, the coefficients within the models for the 11 core metabolites were very consistent between the two groups. So as you can see, isoyous of deoxycholate, for example, was a strong negative predictor in both the models trained on the validation cohort and the discovery cohort showing further the robustness of our findings. So what insight do we get from microbiome health and the role of alpha diversity as a metric of microbiome health? As Noah pointed earlier, several of the metabolites negatively associated with alpha diversity, so metabolites that go up uh, when alpha diversity goes down, like imidazole propionate, are actually detrimental to human health. They can directly promote insulin resistance, indicating that low alpha diversity consistent with previous studies is probably not optimal for human health. However, they might, there might be an upper threshold beyond which alpha diversity, too high alpha diversity can actually be detrimental to human health as well. And that's because of the concentrations of different uremic and cardiac toxins that rise with the diversity of your gut microbiome. TMAO being one example, uh, p crystal sulfate another. So there likely exists this Goldilocks zone where too much is bad and too little is too bad. And if we can get people in this optimal range, that could be ideal for their health. What's worth adding as well is that this ideal zone may vary depending on each individual's health state and physiology, age even. People who, for example, have compromised kidney function may actually uh, benefit more from a slightly lower alpha diversity due to their inability to excrete these uremic toxins through the kidneys, which is the main route of exit from the system. Uh, so having developed these models and really do diving into Shan diversity in the Arville cohort, we wanted to tackle a certain inconsistency in the field, which is the association of alpha diversity with obesity. Uh, previous studies were quite inconsistent in whether alpha diversity goes up or down or remains the same in obese people versus normal weight individuals. Uh, to shed some light on this, we actually divided our cohort not just into obese and normal weight categories, we also extended it to the World Health Organization categories of obese. So obese two and three are individuals whose BMI is over 35. So what could be considered morbid obesity. As you can see in this graph, that's, that is the group that showed the, the strongest decrease in alpha diversity relative to normal weight individuals. While obese one individual still had a slightly de decreased alpha diversity, it was less pronounced than in that obese two, three group. Consistent with this, amplified negative effect in obese to three individuals. They also demonstrate a much higher level of C-reactive protein, so higher levels of inflammation in the obese to three group, 
relative to the obese one and normal weight individuals. And that is shown in the box plot in the top left of the slide. But what we really were curious in asking is whether the metabolites we identified, does their association with gut microbiome health and gut microbiome structure, is it altered in extreme obesity? So to this end, we took our five strongest predictors from our analysis and regressed them against alpha diversity adjusting for covariates in each of the obesity groups separately. And while most of them show very consistent associations with alpha diversity, our main predictor, 5-alpha understand free beta 17-alpha, showed virtually no association in obese 2-3 individuals, while a strong association in all other uh, people in our study. When we extended that analysis to all 11 of our core metabolites, other differences emerged, one being PFOS, which is actually a, a global pollutant, showed a positive association with alpha diversity in obese 2-3 individuals, while no association in normal weight individuals. Once again, pointing that there, there's a perturbation in the blood metabolome gut microbiome relationship in extreme obesity that's worth pursuing further. So to summarize the results of this first project, we were able to very accurately predict alpha diversity using just four of the plasma metabolites, but clinical lab tests and proteomics could not perform the same way. Metabolomics were by far the strongest signal. Specific metabolites associated with alpha strand diversity were also related to human health. And probably what's most striking is that there was a variable relationship between our specific metabolites and strand diversity across the BMI spectrum, with particular disruption to this relationship in severe class two, three obesity. The question that really remains and that we have some theories about is, why is this possible? Why such a small subset of metabolites measured in the blood can capture such diversity in gut microbiome structure across individuals? And for that, I think we have to go back to some basic nutrition and understand diet and really the components we consume in a regular diet. The macronutrients and micronutrients that we focus on most, which are fats, carbohydrates, essential vitamins, uh, amino acids, they actually compromise a very small part of the diversity of our diets. What really separates us from others is this wide array of phytochemical plant compounds that we consume when we drink coffee, when we eat certain vegetables. Over 8,000 structurally different phytochemicals have been identified and over 1,000 different foods have, uh, compounds have been identified in foods. And these compounds are not absorbed in the small intestine. So oftentimes they end up in the large intestine in millimolar concentrations and directly interact with our gut microbiome. This unique diversity, this diversity of phytochemical compounds that makes it into our large intestine is not only metabolized by the gut microbiota, but potentially influences the gut microbes present since many of these polyphenols and phytochemicals have antimicrobial properties. So it contributes to shaping the gut microbiome and likely probably explains some of the vast individual, inter-individual variability between people. But despite their structural diversity, they're all broken down to a much narrower, smaller group of universal compounds, usually phenolic acids, hydroxyphenolic acids. And those were some of the strongest predictors in our, in our models, suggesting that there's this funneling effect of very diverse diets, very diverse microbiomes into a smaller subset of metabolites we can quantify. And this can lead to a more universal measure of gut microbiome health moving forward. So that completes our first project. And we want to present some of our work that's ongoing, that's on BioArchive right now and in review. And that's utilizing deep phenotyping and large cohorts to understand certain patterns in the gut microbiome across aging and healthy aging. And this, uh, this preprint is on BioArchive, so you can find it there. And hopefully will be published soon as well. So a bit of background about what we know so far about aging in the gut microbiome. There's been plenty of research done in early stages of development in children and quite considerable literature as well in old age. And the picture that it collectively paints is that in the first few years of our life, between zero to three years of age, there's high instability in the gut microbiome. Upon birth and breastfeeding, transitioning to solid foods, there's this heterogeneity in your gut microbiome composition. Around three years of age, it stabilizes, and you slowly enter this adult-like microbiome, oftentimes uh, dominated by bacteroidetes and firmicutes. And this microbiome that you have as an adult is thought to be relatively stable up until old age, about 65, 65 plus years old, at which point gradual compositional changes occur. And these often uh, um, correspond to decreased alpha diversity, 
uh, oftentimes frail individuals who enter long-term care have this decline in diversity associated taxa and short chain fatty acid producing taxa. And usually this is associated with various measures of age associated decline. However, there is this inconsistency in the field because several studies have been conducted where gut microbiomes were sequenced of extremely long lived individuals. These are people who live over a hundred years and are functional, are healthy, still frail, but have lived a very healthy and long life. And it oftentimes in this case is we see a very different signature than what happens in old age and what happens in adulthood. Oftentimes alpha diversity is increased. There's a decline in core taxa or core microbes that are shared among individuals and increase in various rare microbes, both beneficial and pathogenic at the same time. But because of the small sizes of, longe of cohorts involved in longevity research, our understanding of this is very minimal since the, there's not that many long-lived individuals who provided stool samples. But using deep phenotype cohorts can give us some insight in actually these aging trajectories and whether what we see in centenarians happens decades earlier in life. So to this end, we use once again the Arville cohort, this time combining both vendors and using all gut microbiome samples, not just the ones that had paired metabolomic data. And we also collaborated with Eric Alwal, Alwal and the Mr. Oz Consortium, which is a cohort of older men originally recruited when they were 65 and over. A prospective cohort study trying to evaluate a fracture, a risk of fractures and osteoporosis in men prospectively. Uh, at their fourth follow-up visit, when all the individuals were over 78 years old, uh, a subset of them provided stool samples. And we actually had follow-up data on their survival as well, which we used in this analysis. So just to briefly, uh, once again, an overview of what happens in extreme longevity. There's this depletion in core taxa, and we see this rise in certain rare microbes, which has been previously termed as this acquisition of a longevity adapted subdominant fraction. And these are both pathogenic uh, and beneficial microbes. But we have this idea that potentially this isn't necessarily detrimental or um, a burden on the host. It actually may be the gut microbiome's adaptation to the changing physiological landscape with aging. And this adaptation can actually be beneficial and even contribute to longevity. But how do you capture this in a large, diverse cohort? And how can we measure whether this pattern originates earlier or uh, at the very end stages of life when you're close to approaching longevity? Our approach was to really focus on this rare fraction. We had this idea that if this pattern occurs earlier, it should probably be characterized by this decrease in core taxa, a rise in rare taxa. But we further believe that, hypothesize that the gut microbiome may actually become more personalized. These rare microbes rise, but the, the microbe that rises in each individual may actually be very specific to that person. So we took a better diversity approach to this question where you calculated the similarity matrix where each sample is compared to everyone else in the cohort. We then take the minimum value for this calculation, which really says, how close are you to your nearest neighbor in the large reference pool of thousands of individuals? And then we take that value and then we use it for downstream analysis. As you can see, both at the genus and ASV level, this metric is normally distributed in a population, which makes it quite, quite good for statistical analysis downstream. So quite interestingly, we, we observed that both at the ASV and at the genus level, gut microbiomes become increasingly unique as you age in the Arville cohort. And the first signs of this increased uniqueness occur at 40, around 40 years of age at the genus level and around 50 years of age at the ASV level. And these are models adjusted for BMI, sex, alpha diversity. We further even validated the same pattern in a separate uh, cohort of over 4,500 individuals, mostly from UK and the US, the American Gut Project, where we saw very, very similar patterns, the same increase uh, with age and uniqueness, particularly in 80 plus year olds, showing that this, this metric or this, this trend we're seeing is quite consistent across very different cohorts. It happens over and over again. Uh, to gain some insight into what actually, if there's this divergence in microbiomes, is there any convergence in phenotype? And because of our previous work with NOAA showing the strong correspondence with the plasma metabolome and gut, the gut microbiome, we once again dove into the metabolomics data for Arville participants and regressed how unique you are uh, to each metabolite, adjusting for once again, alpha diversity, sex, and the other covariates you see in the bottom of the slide. 
to our surprise, we had about eight or nine hits uh, from the panel of 650 metabolites. All of them were microbial in origin, which already was quite exciting that there's a, they're not only strongly associated with uniqueness, they actually are derived from the gut microbiome. Interestingly, some of them, for example, the strongest metabolite associated with, alpha, uh, with our uniqueness measure, phenylacetylglutamine, has previously been proposed as a healthy aging longevity uh, and longevity marker since Italian centenarians show consistently higher levels of phenylacetylglutamine relative to elderly and young controls. Uh, the other analyzes that really um, emerged from this analysis were also indoles, which are tryptophan degradation products in the gut microbiome. And this is particularly interesting because these indoles have a very known immune modulatory role. Uh, different bacteria break down tryptophan into a variety of metabolites, uh, including indole propionate, indole 3 acetate, and indole itself. These metabolites are absorbed by the host, and that's why we can measure them in the plasma. But they also act on very specific receptors, one of them being the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, AHR. And in several animal studies, feeding mice, for example, indoles, was able to extend their health span and survival through action of that receptor because of its modulation of the immune system. So this kind of points us that this trajectory we're seeing might actually be reflective of healthy aging. If these metabolites we're seeing are changing in a way that's consistent, where immune function may be modulated, where there's this adaptation to the host aging, this could actually mean that this is favorable and something that's desirable and should be pursued. Uh, but to really validate that, we need to look at the latest stages of life, where individuals are close to approaching longevity, but also where there's more health heterogeneity, where people have over time either acquired certain chronic conditions and diseases or have remained healthy throughout their long lifespan. Hence, we return to the Mr. Oz cohort, which at, this, at the time of sampling of the gut microbiome, all individuals were so over 78 years of age. The oldest individual is 98, and the mean age was 84. And here are some uh, demographic characteristics stratified by medication use. As you can see, there's quite high prevalence of diabetes, of hypertension, particularly in the high med group. So we have this uniqueness pattern identified in the gut microbiome, and now we want to see whether it's reflective of healthy aging. Our idea was to look at various measures of health in older individuals, but health and healthy aging is not an easy metric to capture. There's self-perceived health, there's actual functional measures, uh, there's comorbidities. So we focus on four different metrics. One is medication use. The more medications you have generally reflects more comorbidities, more diseases. But we compare that with self-perceived health, like whether you think your health is excellent relative to your peers, or you don't think it's as good. Life space score, which actually tells you how functional you are. And walking speed, which is arguably the most validated measure in older populations that reflects your functional status, is indicative of survival, of executive function, with higher, faster walking speed, meaning you're, you're healthier, and slower walking speed, meaning you're less healthy. And finally, we created a composite healthy score where an individual had to be healthy in at least three or more of these criteria to meet our health, uh, healthy composite definition. Uh, quite strikingly, under every stratification we performed, the healthy group showed this consistent pattern of increasing uniqueness with age. And that's shown by the Pearson correlation coefficients for each group with uniqueness on the far left. In the less healthy group, in every case, there was virtually no association uh, it was pretty much a flat line. To further confirm this isn't some artifact or some reflection of alpha diversity, we actually compared it to different alpha diversity measures. But in each case, the, the trends were not there. Healthy individuals did not show a rise in alpha diversity. It was pretty much uh, no signal across both groups studied, indicating that this unique uh, signal captures something independent of just microbiome richness. We paired our uniqueness analysis with differential abundance analysis of microbes that consistently either rise or fall with healthy aging in the healthy group and separately in the rest of the cohort that did not meet our stringent criteria of what we define healthy. As you can see, the only genus that emerged as a significant hit was Bacteroides, which is one of the most uh, dominant genera in the human gut microbiome. As you can see, as healthy individuals age, this core microbe actually gradually decreases, and you just don't see the same pattern in less healthy individuals. When we then looked at specifically 85 plus year olds, so the oldest people in our cohort, and we looked at their survival four years in advance, as they're approaching extreme old age, 
we observed that both relative bacteroides abundance and our uniqueness measure associate with survival. So the higher your bacteroides, if you retain bacteroides into extreme age, you're less likely to survive in the course of our follow-up. Similarly, when you're, if your uniqueness score is lower, you're more likely to die than someone who, who kind of went on this uniqueness trajectory and is microbiome adapted to their aging phenotype. So in conclusion, Noah and I, I think both hopefully show that deeply phenotyped cohorts can provide pretty novel and interesting insight into gut microbiome health. And using some of these higher level gut microbiome measures like alpha diversity or beta diversity can allow us to find more consistent uh, associations between gut microbiome and host physiology. And hopefully, as we've shown in a few instances here, these, these analyses and these comparisons and associations actually do quite well validating across very different cohorts, very different processing pipelines, very different libraries. However, I think there's still a lot of validation to be done. For our metabolomics and alpha diversity paper, I think a major validation is that does this pattern hold across vastly diverse cohorts? If we measure this in the Asian cohort or a European cohort, do the same metabolites correspond to alpha diversity? How universal is this signal? Some preliminary evidence that came out this year from the Twins UK cohort and another Danish European cohort suggests that these metabolites actually are indeed, at least in the European population, quite consistently associated with alpha diversity. But now that we know this association, how can we actually personalize interventions to either change alpha diversity or those, these specific plasma metabolites? For example, we may want to decrease TMAO in an individual and imidazole propionate, but we, they might actually benefit from a higher concentration of indoles or indole propionate. And certain methods like Christian presented with MyCom can actually get us closer to this goal where we can engineer the gut microbiome through these more complex modeling techniques to get at the desired outcome. And I think a big question with our aging analysis is, does the gut microbiome simply reflect healthy aging or does it actually promote it through the synthesis of the metabolites we discussed, primarily tryptophan and indole metabolites highlighted in our analysis? So a lot of questions remain, but very exciting and hopefully we can answer some of them ourselves. With that, I'd like to acknowledge our whole research group and everyone who helped on the projects and our collaborators, including Sean Gibbons, who was uh, crucial in both of the projects presented. Christian Diener, who was absolutely phenomenal and helped a lot in, in the aging project in particular. Uh, my PIs, Nathan Price and Lee Hood, as well as our collaborator, Eric Orwell, Orwell from OHSU. I think now we're gonna have a five minute, three minute break uh, for them to get water or have a bathroom break. And then we'll have closing remarks by my boss, Nathan. Thank you everyone.